when I go to Korea these days, uh, I think many people in Korea, uh, they wonder whether uh, Korea's uh, you know, power has peaked, uh, just like uh, maybe Japan in 30 years ago. And a lot of uh, growing concern about uh, economics, uh, you know, demographic changes, and politics, uh, and so on. So uh, Professor Wu uh, will be uh, addressing uh, those issues uh, today. And he is uh, now Associate Professor of Economics at DePaul University in Chicago. And he published uh, in a book uh, lately, uh, Confronting South Korea's uh, Next Crisis uh, by uh, Oxford University Press. And he's not only academic, also has a very uh, extensive uh, experience uh, in you know, international organization and also in the sector. Uh, for example, he was a chief uh, Korea economist at the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, also senior economist at IMF, also working at uh, OECD and so on. So, you know, he has uh, both academic and you know, policy experience. Very much looking forward to uh, his uh, sharing his uh, you know, insights and, 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 and thoughts. And he, uh, he went to the best college in Korea at Yonsei. But he went to the second best uh, university in the United States for <laughs> at Harvard. <laughs> but uh, uh, he's uh, speaking on confronting South Korea's next crisis, uh, polarization, and fear of uh, Japanification. So please welcome uh, Dr. Woo. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for uh, your kind invitation to speak. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, talk about today's topic uh, with you. So uh, hopefully during the Q&A and then maybe even afterwards, I look forward to speaking with you if there's any other uh, thing we can do uh, outside uh, whatever I could do within the uh, 45 minutes. So um, as Dr. Shin uh, introduced, this, the title actually, uh, I took it from the book that I published uh, last year. Um, I, I presented in uh, UC Berkeley and uh, Barry Eichen Green, uh, uh, professor of economics, he, as a half joke, uh, last year he said, you could have uh, titled Confronting South Korea as a Next Crisis as a floral because uh, uh, if you hear me what I'm saying today, but you will get a sense why there may be actually multiple crises, not just one. Uh, but this book, uh, very briefly, uh, give you some background. Um, uh, I had a privilege to work at the uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, based in Hong Kong, as a chief Korea economist, uh, 2015 through 17. Uh, during this period, I had an opportunity to watch very closely uh, the Korean economy. Although I'm from Korea, but uh, it was a quite intensive you know, time because I had to write, forecast, everything. And also, I met a lot of, a lot of people, market participants, not only my colleagues in equity and fixed income, uh, you name it, corporate banking, uh, and also government officials. Uh, and uh, in the process, I wrote uh, quite a few, I mean, 145 notes about the Korean economy. So after I decided to come back to the academia, I was you know, thinking to myself, I'm going to write something. Uh, new because uh, so many books written about the past, the uh, economic miracle in Korea. So that's the uh, actually idea. But uh, what I'm going to do today, uh, my talk will be based on, yes, based on the book. But since I finished the book, actually, there's also a lot of things happen. Although, uh, as I'm going to also speak about it uh, one way or another, a lot of things happen, but in a bit uh, not uh, surprising manner. So confirming actually, uh, unfortunately confirming my concern uh, that I laid out in the book. So making easier my job today, but uh, that's uh, one aspect. So I'm going to give you some updates also. But first I'm going to give you some taste of what actually type of a risk we are talking about. But then uh, the second part, I'm going to focus on the more uh, analytical, you know, what type of data evidence and the why uh, the growth has declined, what actually the uh, promising avenue 
for the future. So that kind of things are coming later, but uh, without further ado, let me talk about this. So a lot of uh, books been uh, written, uh, uh, but coming, you know, 1980s and Alice Amstead at MIT, uh, even uh, Song byung nak uh, from National University in Seoul, many people wrote about it, so no need to talk about it. And then K-pop, now global phenomenon, so all famous. And then as a Korean, I uh, tremendously proud of it. But that's not what we're uh, going to talk about today. Rather, if you actually carefully look at what happened in the last 10 years or even before then, even before a pandemic, uh, Korea has been actually uh, increasingly beset with uh, uh, both internal and then the external risk. And uh, just to name a few, uh, slowing growth, rising inequality, pervasive you know, elderly poverty, uh, unemployment problems, and record high uh, household debt. And then uh, in, on top of that, in the uh, even bigger uh, the trend, uh, population, uh, the aging is a serious problem. And uh, last year, fertility rate is like uh, 0.78. You never heard of it. And then in Korea, so many people concerned that we're going to be like you know, Japan, but it could be worse. Because uh, if you look at it, net foreign asset, for example, about 70% of the GDP, Korea is about a half of it, 40% yeah? something. And then uh, outside, uh, China is increasingly, uh, uh, you know, uh, becoming a tech super uh, power. And also a lot of new technologies clashing with the uh, existing uh, structural issues. And then uh, politics. Uh, hopefully I can touch upon some issues, but uh, quite a hopeless in a sense. So if you look at the last few years, then uh, maybe not surprising, given the context of what happening in Korea, but quite a surprising. Goldman Sachs, Barclay, UBS, uh, VVVA, you name it, Macri, so many, and the CD Bank also uh, closes uh, retail business. Of course, a lot of reason is, uh, well, uh, they are not going to make a lot of a profit, number one, and then also regulations. So it's quite telling what's going on in uh, Korea. Well, I'm going to make it a more, uh, you know, the, the empirical evidence, et cetera, but uh, I don't want to sound uh, like a cliche, but actually it is. In my view, and then also in the book, which started uh, 2018, and the two, even back then I thought this is going to be it. So in a sense, Korea is at the peak, you know, pinnacle of modern history, but uh, if they don't do anything with the uh, uh, existing uh, structural problem, then most likely uh, uh, today's uh, Europe, maybe Italy or uh, France, or maybe worse, uh, Japan, uh, three or uh, three plus uh, lost decade. And uh, there are actually many multiple risks uh, will might compound this continuous, you know, the decline in growth in a way created a stagnation for a long time. And um, well, as Dr. Shin mentioned, that nowadays, yes, people waking up sort of this kind of uh, realities, uh, given the fact after the COVID, inflation uh, crisis, and then much higher interest rate, and then, uh, as I'm going to show you, the current economic situation is pretty bad. So people see this way, but uh, if you look at, uh, again, uh, last 10 uh, years plus, then indeed, actually, this type of uh, dramatic shifts in the perceived you know, the Korean situation uh, caught many people actually by surprise. So um, this is the motivation, but this is something I want to talk about. And then, uh, but you will see actually uh, good news is, there is actually good news out of bad news. Because uh, I already spoken of a lot of uh, concerns uh, upfront, but there is actually uh, pretty good news I'm going to talk about, especially if the uh, uh, if they can get the policy right. But to be concrete, because I'm not so sure how much time I'm going to have later when I show you uh, uh, empirical work, but in here, for example, if the policy uh, reform measures in print place plus global economic growth recovery takes place, then actually under the right condition, we can look at the 3% or close to 3%. Nowadays, actually, Koreans would think that out of reach. But just a few years back, 
people were still talking about a 3% uh, speed limit. But then uh, not none of this happened. Let's say um, uh, no global growth uh, recovery, and then uh, no domestic uh, overhaul. Then it might go down to 1% toward the uh, late this decade, precisely 26 through the 30, uh, 2030, on average growth can go down to 1%. But that's not all. In the worst case scenario, which I'm going to spell out, multiple risk, like a high debt, inequality, that actually took me a while. How this can play out, conspire that kind of a, uh, you know, sort of a worst case scenario. Uh, but that's one of my uh, struggles when I wrote, uh, you know, the book. Clearly, that added up, then it can go even much damaging, uh, really, Japan-style uh, stagnation. So I'll show you, uh, what do you what do I mean by that. And uh, yeah, I already mentioned that there are a lot of books. And then uh, these are the, some uh, topics. So it's, instead of uh, uh, looking at the, uh, you know, the just overview, uh, this book actually uh, driven by the uh, high impact questions and the variety of topics. So pretty much I'm going to talk, talk about the growth issues today, but in tangent, population aging, private debt, yes. But there's other inequality issues in the job, labor market issues, even a political business cycle in Korea. Very fascinating. And uh, in the US context, many people wrote it, like Alessina, Hips, but the mechanism and then uh, channels are actually very different. But still, there is, because uh, many people told me and then said there is no business cycle, you know, political business cycle in Korea, but there is. And a lot of uh, politics and then political, you know, the uh, decision, a major uh, policy decision, fiscal monetary, and then uh, there's something good news about, uh, the, about Korea is actually Korea became a wealthy nation. So that's the idea, but uh, let me go on, uh, give you some taste what it's like. So, Walking you back around 1997, there was a financial crisis we had. It. That marks the end of the rapid growth period for Korea. And then, uh, equally surprising though, the next year, uh, 1999 and 20, bounded at 11.5% and then 9.1% after dipping down uh, minus 5.1% uh, 1997. So, equally surprising, but after that, Economic growth averaged only 4.9%, which is almost half of it uh, we've seen uh, pre-1990s, you know, like 8.6%. If you go back to 1960s, then 9.3%, uh, so almost half of it. But it was not enough. We had a global financial crisis, 0.8%, but then it rebounded 6.8%. Uh, so at the time, even including uh, Bank of Korea, they thought, well, we're going to have a pretty strong, but not as strong as in the 90, and, but it's going to be around 4 to 5%. That was the expectation, but it didn't materialize. Actually, continuously, uh, uh, you know, sharply down. Then following year, 3.7%, and then 2015, 25 and then uh, just before COVID, 2.2%, uh, and then this year, my focus actually 1.3%, and next year, one percent when I uh, was uh, asked by the uh, Foreign Affairs only this year, January, I uh, wrote it down of 1.4%. That was the, my forecast. And then I kept it until last week when we had a third you know, quarter GDP came out. And then I, in my calculation, it will be very hard to achieve the 1.4%. Um, Bank of Korea has that 1.4%, but they started out with 1.8%. They downgraded May 1.6%. August 1.4%, uh, and then you can see it, uh, how bad it is. This is actually second worst you know, the, uh, growth. And next year, uh, if you look around US and Japan, Euro zone and China especially, uh, nothing actually would be better. So it'll be a bit more technical rebound based on the uh, base effect, but it'll be very uh, uh, tough. So obviously, you know, sorting out uh, all this element going into the uh, slowdown, what will take, you know, to uh, bring it back, you know, the growth? Actually, very important question, and yet very complex, yeah? So that's the uh, idea. But then uh, another snapshot you will tell you, it's not just a domestic or a export. Actually, both actually gone down. 
step down. But then one very surprising fact, which is in the chapter two, when you look at the recovery process, then in, in the past 11 cycle in Korea, export and investment strongly rebound and then put the economy back to you know, a pre uh, uh, trend. But surprisingly, in the last cycle, we don't see that. You see that blue line? Compared to all other recovery process. So that was another uh, quite a surprising, but that also uh, responsible for why it has been so weak recovery on top of a trend growth slowdown. But then, of course, we have some clue. So, so give you some idea before I get to the more fundamental, you know, the uh, uh, structural point of view, the uh, what actually causing the growth problem, and then what are the bottlenecks, etc. But in here, of course, Korea, uh, you know, has a uh, extensive you know, FTA with uh, 56 countries covering uh, three quarters of uh, all the output, globalization in retreat, and also China problems. But uh, before we get there, China, next slide. You know, think about it, uh, Korea, then about a uh, top five semiconductor, uh, machinery, petrochem and petroleum, automobiles accounting for about 50% of that. And if you added another five, then it explained almost 70, 80% of a Korean expo. Meaning, Korea industrial structure is very unique in a sense, highly concentrated in a very handful of the industry. But these are increasingly becoming a mature industry, meaning less of room for further growth in the future. And uh, there's already signs of a decline. But on top of that, heavy reliance on China, well known. So look at this, blue line is the Korean export total as a percent of GDP, but then green line, uh, the, the China bound Korean export as percent of GDP. Well, on the way up, up until say uh, 2015 before China, uh, very, you know, roughly, you know, the dropping down in terms of growth rate, up until then it was a boon for a Korea. But now China is going down on its own, so, in this time, obviously, heavy reliance on China is becoming a disadvantage. But not just that. As you know, China emerging as a tech, you know, the uh, uh, superpower, and that's the, uh, the, where the problem is. So if you look at this, then um, market share sort of. In the entire world export market, gone down to 2.74%. Uh, so it's not just, uh, um, globalization retreat, but uh, seemingly there is some uh, erosion in the um, competitive advantage of a Korean product. And uh, China's story is actually clearly telling us. If you look at it, uh, uh, automobiles or a smartphone, IT product, even cosmetic, once the darlings of a Chinese uh, consumers, actually they lost a big chunk of uh, market shares. Well, partly because of that, uh, because of the uh, the, the Chinese drive to move, you know, uh, the, the sort of uh, promoting their own domestic product, and also the capability, technical capability is actually rising. That's one reason. But at the same time, uh, 2017, as we know, after the uh, third, you know, the anti-missile system installation in South Korea, China actually starting to retaliate uh, for that. So non-tariff measures and then a lot of other measures they have so, for example, automobiles, uh, Korean uh, Hyundai lost you know, the market share at one point 10 years ago around 10%, but now it's around 2%. Samsung, you know, the uh, smartphone, Galaxy, one time uh, 30% above 10 years ago, but now it's uh, less than 1%. We know that. So it's not just the retaliation, but also uh, that also telling us uh, what actually China has been doing, you know, slowly, but increasingly uh, uh, competing uh, against Korean uh, products. And uh, we have some gain in the US market and this Eurozone, but it's not enough to compensate that uh, loss in the uh, market. And also another uh, snapshot, if you look at this market uh, manufacturing uh, utilization rate, well below average starting in uh, 2011-12, uh, and then accept this strong rebound from the uh, COVID uh, lift off, you see that? down the trend, sentiment is pretty bad. 
youth unemployment was really high, creeping up at a somewhat uh, smaller magnitude, but uh, general unemployment rate. But this is actually a bit uh, strange. Well, of course, reflection of a strong rebound 2021, we had a 4.1%. You see that this glue, the, the green is the actually young uh, workers. But also, uh, you have to take a look. More recent months, about a year, none of the job actually gained in, the, in this age group. Most of them actually created for uh, 60 above. If you look at manufacturing, which I'm not showing here, also continues you know, the contracting. On top of that, some people actually left. And then uh, starting 2017, 18, 19, this is the uh, working age population shrinking around now uh, 200, uh, 50 mid 200, but increasingly more. So it'll be over uh, 300,000 shrinking uh, because of uh, aging. So you're creating some sort of uh, labor shortage, and then some people left. So that's why we had it, uh, uh, but still high, like above 6%. But some of the uh, notorious you know, the youth unemployment has been solved in a bit. But uh, if you look at the details, then really uh, uh, not encouraging, yes? And then this is really what I found myself actually uh, striking, because uh, we are told all the time in the last uh, few decades, virtual circle, like uh, rapid growth and then low income inequality. But Korea, look at this blue line. This is the top 10% income share, exceeding the US level, accounting for a 94, uh, 49%, uh, according to Min Gi Hong, the Labor Institute in Korea, compared to famous, you know, the, uh, the top 1% data, the PKD in science. And even, even if you look at 1%, uh, then income share is about 14% compared to 18% in the US. But it's not just top income. Whether you look at a Gini coefficient like this, except maybe Chile, Mexico, this traditionally very you know, uh, bad income distribution, right, the country, and then except that then pretty high. And then another serious problem, this is actually national poverty rate, but if you look at the uh, elderly, then still above 40% last year, and that this is really uh, causing a lot of uh, uh, social issues, right? And then this one, you might wonder, non-regular workers. Yes, I'm going to talk about labor problems uh, later, labor rigidity. But this is one type of a byproduct, the rigidity in the uh, regulatory system, rigidity in the uh, institutional problem. I'm going to come back later. But this causing also massive income. Why? These non-regular workers, like temporary contract workers, according to Korea statistics uh, definition, 37.5% last year of the whole you know, the labor force. They get about 50% of a regular workers, you know, the uh, large corporation or small, medium-sized company. And uh, of course, that's part of the uh, result of a very you know, stringent employment protection, et cetera. So companies uh, want to go for a cheaper labor if they can, right? So that causing another structural aspect of income inequality. So however you look at uh, many different dimensions, telling the story, very surprising story, Korea has a lot of uh, inequality problem. And then my calculation is about uh, uh, taking off a 0.17% annual uh, in terms of uh, per capita GDP growth. But then that's not all. If you look at this, then uh, this uh, red line is the household debt as a percent of GDP. And the blue line is the uh, corporate debt as a percent of GDP. Well, after the global, uh, after Korean financial crisis, well, because of the uh, leveraged growth at the time, so that the uh, corporate debt restructuring gone down a bit, uh, quite, quite a bit, sorry, and then uh, stabilized around 100%, but after the COVID really took off again. And then household debt has been nonstop Actually, Korea is one of the very few countries that never did uh, deleverage yet since global financial crisis. Some of the uh, comparison, look at this. All other countries except China and Korea has not yet banking crisis. Okay? But this is also another comparison with Japan uh, with the famous you know, bubble period. And this one, if you look at the household debt, then about half is uh, mortgage debt. So closely tied to the housing market, the famous Japan bubble period, 80, 
say 1986 or uh, five to the uh, 89 and 90, went up four times, yes? Land price, housing price, and stock price went up four times. Well, this blue line, if you go back to say 2010, more than 10 years ago, then if you start from there, then yes, comparable to that, almost you know 237 percent up. So um, you know almost 3.5 times, pretty high. But if you look at it last few years, then uh, striking actually more than 100 percent, although it's down. Stock is not as crazy as in the, the Japan, so maybe that's uh, less. But Here's the thing, though. Again, I'm going to talk about upfront because uh, if I have I'll give you more details, but Korea, in a nutshell, is not going to be like Japan uh, suffering whenever this asset price collapse. It will lead to the uh, banking crisis. That actually, not so sure. Thanks to the uh, very stringent regulation in Korea, Household debt, for example, down, uh, down payment, very significant, 30 and 40 percent. And then um, uh, the, um, the banks very well capitalized. And then almost 70 percent of the debt owned by the wealthy, the top 40 percent of the income group. So that's actually a bit more uh, uh, drag on the growth rather than outright uh, fiscal you know, instability, uh, uh, the risk. And also, stock market, well, we have not seen that kind of uh, bubbles yet. But even if that happened, what actually different from uh, Japan is Korea's, uh, Korean's banks are not allowed to own uh, stocks anything more than like a 4%, something like that. Insurance company about uh, below 15%. But Japan had it, uh, no limit like that. Therefore, uh, when the stock went up uh, four times, collapsed, you know, so many banks actually uh, hurt by this because uh, on their book, asset items collapsed, then causing the uh, banking crisis, which we don't have it, luckily. So again, uh, that's more details coming up later, but I want you to know that some differences. But nevertheless, you know, the bank has gone up a 64% year basis this year so far. And then uh, corporate loans, uh, uh, delinquency rate at 1.5, and then uh, household debt are about a 0.8, although the non-bank financial institution actually is having a serious, more serious, higher uh, delinquency rate. But as I argued in the book, and still I believe that uh, it will be more uh, slow burn in a sense that highly indebted consumers in general, and then debt service burden is around 36% of this world of income compared to say 10%, below 10% in the US, it will be more on uh, consumption, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, reductions, okay? And then uh, the corporate side, this is also another uh, big uh, concern. This blue line measuring the so-called marginal firms. Marginal firms, uh, you know, definition, the annual operating income less than uh, interest cost. So they cannot even cover that interest, that service cost with their own uh, earnings and then way up and up, right? Even before COVID, you see that? Throughout uh, more than 10 years. But then there was a company by the shop declined the sales. Exception is this one again, uh, 2021, 2020, uh, the 20 and then 21, yes? Rebound. At the time, export actually ran up very strongly. But except that, now it's a 40.5%. Clearly, these kind of companies uh, have no uh, room for uh, additional capital investment. So either consumption, investment, from the high debt burden, it'll actually depress. So even without having a banking crisis, you can see that why it can, it's going to uh, uh, depress the you know, economic activities for a long time until it's unwinds, yes? And then you see that these numbers are the patterns of uh, 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 um, the number of firms uh, restructuring. This is famous, you know, the population aging. Uh, this year, uh, we're going to have uh, around 17.5% are the uh, 65 above in the whole population. In 2020-30, uh, uh, it'll be a 25%, and then uh, in 20-plus uh, years' time, it's going to be 40%. And uh, many people um, in, back in Korea, like KDI, one of the leading government institutes, many people think that uh, 
Aging alone can make the career just like Japan. And uh, this is one of the kind of very anecdotal you know, the evidence. 1964, that's the year of uh, Olympic Games uh, in Tokyo. 88, in Seoul. Very instantly, no, maybe I guess a coincidence, but around 24 years apart, if I put it together, yes, in post, then red line is Korea, the GDP per capita level, and then blue line is Japan. Maybe you see that? So maybe we are going <laughs> to just already reach the, uh, where the Japan was. And then, of course, aging means a uh, uh, huge you know, fiscal uh, spending. So there are a lot of uh, concern. But one thing we need to be careful about, though, yes, Japan, for example, you know, pop, the, the, wage, the working age population gone down 15% uh, since 1994. But labor force actually went up around above 3%. I guess that this will be the similar patterns in Korea. That's what I took in when I, uh, the, the project, in you know, the next 30, uh, 10 years uh, long-term uh, projection later on, I'll show you. But Germany, much the same story. 98 peaked out uh, working age population, gone down about uh, uh, more than 5.5%, the size of the working age population. But labor force up more than 9% since 1998. So there are some uh, things we don't know yet. And uh, this is another story. 60 plus labor force participation in Korea has an up and up, in part because of uh, the, uh, the practice. Many people have to retire involuntarily at the age of around 50 even, yes, sometimes even younger. And then they re-enter the market but then earning much lower, uh, low paying job, right? But because why? Because of a weak uh, pension uh, system, yeah? So with that idea, let's take a look at uh, some um, more, uh, the structural view, uh, what actually causing the problems, and then where might be a promising area. But upshot, the main conclusion in this, empirical analysis would be structural rigidity and institution backward is a central part of the explanation of what, where we are in terms of a low productivity. You will see that productivity is very low. And that this actually holding a key to a reviving the growth. So to arrive at this you know, conclusion, we have to look at many things, as I'm going to show you. First, I looked at it, OK, then how I can explain myself and then other people, how should we understand this growth of decline that you saw earlier? What's the reason? And then key reason is uh, labor productivity growth sharp decline, almost a decade long. And then once you ask why, then it is driven by the two things. Total factor productivity is a measure of uh, technological progress, but more broadly, how the economy allocates the resources, how efficiently or inefficiently allocate the resources, and then uh, capital stock accumulation itself. Of course, we have uh, you know the circumstances, you know the forces, convergence because Korea is now uh, what uh, GDP per capita uh, just a dollar basis, then uh, about thirty-five thousand dollars. PPP above $40,000, slightly above the half of the US. Yeah? And then uh, this one, I'm going to show you. Growth rate has been declining on the one hand, but level is also very low. It's not because of human capital or physical capital stock. So I'm saying that we have a limitation in terms of uh, input you know, driven growth, as we did in the past decade because of accumulating more capital in the human capital won't actually have any much impact. But then the global trend, probably globalization, we know of it the last two, three decades, probably not going to come back, right? And also China is no longer actually boon for the Korean uh, economy anymore. So all of this means responsible for this slowdown in the growth, but it's not going to sustain uh, the future growth. And yet, we still have to think about it, where we can find this productivity growth, because that level is so low. So that's my logic. Okay? And then I do show that data. Once you 
decompose the labor productivity level, then where is it coming from? Then, very surprisingly, it is coming from the very low total factor productivity. As I hinted, it's not because of a low human capital or human the, the physical capital stuff. No, up is actually very high. And yet, total factor productivity is very low. So we have a low, sharp decline in the productivity growth on the one hand, and yet level is also very low, but that very low labor productivity coming from, explained by their low uh, total factor productivity. Otherwise, in uh, human capital, well, if you will need to take it, uh, numbers at, uh, uh, at the face, yes, at least the number of uh, college graduates, et cetera, right? Number of uh, education, uh, the attainment, then on par with the US. There's uh, also a lot of things we can talk about, the quality, but, and then the capital stock for uh, the size of the US, uh, the Korean economy is a uh, 139% actually greater than US. Much the same story goes even compared to Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. So Korea is a sort of an outlier in the sense that very, having a very low disrespect productivity. But then uh, logic goes, what uh, might cause that uh, this low total factor productivity, right? And uh, there's a very large, you know, uh, the literatures in the economics connecting this total factor productivity with the regulatory environment, institutional quality. Okay, that's where I'm heading. Because uh, when I digging up and then chasing after, you know, what's cause and then what's next, and then and that's, you know. The, the, I have to go for many different things until I can pull together to have a better picture, which I'm showing you here. So it's a lot of things involved, but uh, just up front, I'm going to explain the more details, show you the data. But this rigidities in the product labor market, very excessive and then outdated regulation, and then institutional quality problem. I'm going to spell out what it is. But this actually holding a key to the future growth. Because if you look at the data, I'll show you, Korea actually performs very poorly in this all regulation environment and then institutional setting. Of course, at some point, I asked, and then I'll show you, is this going to be a promising avenue? Meaning, if we do something about it, then really it'll boost you know, the productivity growth. Like a German case, Hartz reform is a good illustration. It can, yes, it can. And um, I'm going to show you, but uh, let me talk about uh, first why and then how it might matter. So give you some bunch of storyline okay, here before I, again, uh, show you the matching the data evidence. In a big picture, Korea has improved a bit uh, regulatory environment right after the financial crisis under the IMF program, et cetera, 1990. But then in the second, uh, more the recent decade, either deteriorated or uh, plateaued. So in general, pretty low. But what do you mean by this? So for example, pro, uh, pro market uh, regulation, excessive or outdated uh, regulation, entry barriers for uh, startups, or uh, Korea specific dominance or large company, the relationship between Chapel and then uh, subcontracting uh, small, medium sized company, that actually discourages pretty heavily this competition in the economy, also frustrating uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Yeah? So, for example, you know, the, these days, an online platform company, uh, Tada, was like a, a Uber type of a company in Korea. Up until 2020, it actually was very popular, much cheaper than a taxi, and it has a daily users of 1.7 million. But taxi operators uh, protest, obviously. They don't like the, this new innovation, hurt their business. And then Congress actually uh, passed a bill requiring this Tada, the Ubers, right? Korea's Uber, Tada drivers to have a taxi license. I mean, if you have a taxi license, why would you drive for a you know, Uber type because uh, you can get paid more, right? So Tada went out of business uh, April 2020. FinTech, bit a uh, different story, but uh, it took a long time because uh, for a different reason though. 
fintech, you know, like internet banking, you know, uh, struggled so many years up until 2018, the, the Congress changed the law along the, uh, this, uh, the banks can uh, raise the uh, uh, bank equity more than 4%. So they wanted to sever that uh, links between uh, industrial power and then banking system. So it is a sort of a safeguard, and yet internet banking, how they can scale up without raising money from, say, tech company. Yeah? These are non-financial uh, company. So under the existing law, you cannot raise money on the more than 4%. So they changed that. But the illustration is uh, there are a lot of uh, regulation reason you cannot do easily. And these, these days are very interesting. A lot of things. Law Talk, that's another uh, legal, uh, online legal service. And then uh, telemedicine. And then uh, Gangnam Money, very interesting. Uh, Korea Beauty, like a cost, the online platform. Sometimes I'm like a, a online uh, accounting, tax accounting uh, service. These are all governments, the Congress doesn't do anything. Therefore, uh, pretty much like between the old association, Association of uh, Medical, you know, the, 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 the Korea Association of Medicines, and then the Bar Association, you name it, Association of uh, uh, Tax and Accountants, they're all against that, that kind of uh, new technology. So until the government paved the road, I mean, set the new, you know, the, the, the traffic signal, right? What can be done, not done, in how way, so essentially uh, completely stand still. So that's kind of a cost we are talking about in terms of regulation. But then labor market. Korea has a very notorious, almost like a European style uh, employment uh, protection law. So when I was at the BAML, then people would uh, make a joke. You know, uh, I was based in Hong Kong, and about 200 people based in the Seoul office. When I go back, you know, every month, then they say, well, you know, until they're going to fire me, I'm not going to leave. Because uh, for some reason, if they can fire you, then your severance fees or all this, you know, the uh, compensation. So oftentimes, foreign company, what do they do? They reallocate you either Hong Kong or Singapore, and then why on your, on your plane, they can fire you. I mean, that was kind of a joke, yeah? But anyway, that's very seriously, this type of uh, inflexible labor uh, regulation. And also, if you look at the elderly workers, then we need to think about how we can utilize these elderly workers. Then this so-called you know, the seniority-based pay has to be changed because uh, they're making uh, increasingly more expensive for the company point of view, retain them, right? So there was some several attempts under the Park Geun-hye government, but it didn't go well. So there are a lot of issues, pension, retirement ages, and then that uh, payment system entangled. High youth unemployment is part of that, the rich labor market. And then you saw that all your non-regular workers, 37.5%, more than uh, one third of a uh, career labor force is actually non-regular workers. But this is because why? Because again, uh, very strong protection for regular workers, often unionized. And then the uh, rest of them very flexible, but they don't have any union power or anything. And uh, companies exploiting this kind of uh, loopholes in the law, heavily uh, you know, using them. But gap, I told you about 50% uh, only. So this type of uh, structural rigidity that I'm talking about, and also in general, the literature telling us either innovation, resource allocation, and then this uh, production cost, through those channels, it'll hurt the uh, productivity. And yet, if you look at the data I show you, Korea actually has a many problems. But someone actually asked me a while ago, OK, we understand that, and the Korea may be known for that. But why it is a matter? And then if you follow me so far, my logic, then yes, we are not going to be able to hide or mask with the strong export growth. Globalization is gone. And then we cannot do any more just putting more uh, human capital and the fiscal capital, it's not going to work because we already have high enough. So that's number one reason. We are not going to have offsetting forces. Number two, also there is uh, evidence showing that uh, as the countries like Korea becoming more and more sophisticated, 
get close to the global uh, frontiers, then it'll be even more difficult to uh, innovate. It'll be more damaging. So <laughs> I don't have much time left. So with that idea, that's where uh, I'm going. Like uh, this uh, structural you know, rigidity is the one actually having a promise. And then on, on the basis of those uh, number of exercise, counterfactual, just give me just a few more minutes. Um, the counterfactual, then I uh, calculate how much each you know, labor, product market, institutional quality change could, uh, how much impact on the productivity gains. And then that's where I uh, come up with a number, either 3%, 1%, et cetera. But let me show you the data quick. But there are so many other stuff, but I cannot do it today, but um, here. So if you look at the GDP growth rate, 10, 6.9, gone down quite a sharp. Almost twice as fast, this decline, the pace, compared to, say, well-known uh, cross-country regression or convergence, 2% rate, almost twice as this, the pace of the declining growth. But this is mainly coming from where? Labor productivity. Because uh, employment, labor force actually gone up. I told you the uh, elderly workers actually participating in the labor market. We entered the labor market in a big mass. And then, uh, yes, aging means uh, shrinking uh, uh, the, uh, the working age population up until 2019. It was still positive, but uh, much smaller. So except this aging effect, predominant growth slowdown caused by the uh, the accompanied by the labor productivity growth slowed down. But then, this one, where is it coming from? This is a total factor productivity, as I mentioned earlier, three to almost zero, and then this capital stock per worker, and then a point nine. Human capital is about a steady, but as I said, this K itself is pretty high already, so this is the really main problem, total factor productivity. That's closely related to that regulatory environment. And, um, but this is one of the, the data showing you Korea compared to US, total factor productivity only 37%. But for example, Taiwan, Singapore, then they do actually much better compared to US. Yeah? So clearly, Korea is very uh, unbalanced in many ways. Yeah? And this is where Korea is low productivity because of low. Total, uh, total factor productivity. And then here's the data. This is the uh, regulatory measures and the legal system institutional quality. Many economists, you know, the research find out in the past decade, it's not just the regulatory labor or product market itself, because uh, more broader sense, even the public trust, anti-corruption, and um, independence judicial system, all that matters because uh, where the people will go for uh, uh, putting their time and energy to do a rent seeking or corrupt behavior versus more productive. But if you look at this, the inside the, the parenthesis, all ranking in this number of samples. This is coming from the two data source. One is a, a, a Simon Fraser Institute in Canada, and then a World Bank a survey of the sur uh, survey. Uh, governance matters. So all this matters a lot. And then I wrote in the uh, uh, Foreign Affairs uh, piece, Korea, you know, judiciary uh, capture is quite evident because uh, many judges actually, if they don't get a promotion, they just join the uh, legal teams of a Chebo. Then who's going to win? Yes? And uh, technology stealing and then uh, forced the technology transfer. You, I mentioned that the large Chebos and the small medium company. One of the they do is these days, they just uh, try to invalidate the patent system. They actually using it without permission, but then you know, when they are uh, sued, et cetera, then uh, they try to invalidate. So it is also a serious problem. I wouldn't say that I mean, Samsung uh, you know, grew like that uh, through the stealing, no, but, but I'm saying that uh, the relationship, you know, how it is uh, uh, dominated by the uh, large com uh, company. And uh, this is one of the, uh, the uh, highlight here. So these are the numbers, but look at this. Australia, Canada, except for France. France is actually pretty bad in terms of regulation, but all other, US, UK, Sweden, uh, Singapore, Japan. Then 
some of the measures, business regulation, administrative uh, requirement, labor regulation, hiring firing regulation, impartial court, and all that corruption uh, measures, anti-corruption measures, regulatory uh, numbers, or higher the number is better. This is Korea. This is a top you know, advanced 10 countries average. And then third column, uh, you know, um, that, so this is the gap. If you close the gap, 0.6, 1.6, et cetera, then uh, in view of uh, empirical evidence, all very strongly uh, significant in the regression work, using this coefficient, we do the you know, counterfactual. If we match that up, how much this productivity gains might be quite substantial. Take a look. Corruption, 1.1% is going to have also knock-on effect on the employment gain. Together, 1.3% can be left up. And the labor market regulation making a, a loser, 0.6 and 0.1 is going to be 0.7, quite a substantial annual growth rate. So of course, this is one of the exercise. And then somebody, of course, even my, myself include, can it be actually realized and materialized? But then I pointed out German case. Indeed, they did um, 2003 and then five uh, hearts reform. They made it the uh, labor market much more uh, looser. And then uh, one of the outcome was a productivity gain, labor hours employment, or improved. So during the global financial crisis, people talked about a so-called German miracle, right? Unemployment rate was not like in the US above 10%, unlike it. So indeed, it showed that the well-designed structural changes could have a tangible impact, you know, positive impact on the economy, boosting investment and productivity. So that's my uh, uh, sort of uh, argument. But on the, the couple of more slides. Actually, this I have not spoken yet, the uh, service and then uh, small companies, uh, why they are so unproductive. Again, uh, one of the reasons is uh, regulation, but also a legacy of uh, unbalanced growth strategy of the past governments. Because uh, they wanted to focus with the limited resources, promoting uh, manufacturing and export sectors at the cost of the rest of the uh, uh, other sectors. But service sector is pretty big, hiring 70% uh, of uh, workers compared to, say, only 16% in manufacturing. And yet, they are vastly unproductive. So this is a blue ocean, right, for the Korea. And the small, medium-sized company also, again, only one-third of productivity. Okay? So with that, I did some calculation in here. And um, one is this, aging only. So I took the numbers from the regression that I show you, although I didn't go into detail. But you can take my word. So this aging means on the next up until 25, annually, working age population will go down 0.9%, and then it will gather in a pace, 1.2% in the next second half of this decade. And then that has an implication for a productivity, bringing down 0.25 and 0.5. That's actually my conservative estimate. And then this labor hours is going down. Under the Moon Jae-in government, 68 uh, the work hours per week gone down to 52. And yet, even at this pace, 0.9% annually reduction in the uh, labor hours, by 2030, we're still working 29% longer than the German workers and 1.5 times longer than US of what? 2019 level. But comparing a Korea's 2013 versus US Germany 2019 at this pace. So, uh, it's still, uh, uh, I guess, that, uh, reasonable, still because uh, Korea will be a, you know, longest hours uh, even end of this decade. But if you com combine all together, then 1%. That's the basis that I told you earlier. But then uh, labor force participation, especially all among the elderly, it can go up like uh, 1.4 and 1.6 based on the Japan and German experience. So it can be higher, 1.5. And then this one, if we have a sort of a semi closer to the, what we had at, uh, before global financial crisis, then Korea export boom and investment, and then I taking about a two thirds of it, probably we are not going to go close to that. But as a thought experiment, then you can push above 2%. And then if you combine the two good things, 
let's say, regulatory form and then uh, uh, better global economic condition, then we can go above, you know, say, close to 3%, and then sweeping a reform, then I take into only one-fourth because uh, I recognize it will be very difficult. I visited many different countries when I was at the IMF and OECD, but uh, oftentimes it is quite a, uh, sort of we become uh, discouraged because uh, from the, what we see, what we know from the uh, scholarly debates or textbook model versus what actually happening. So it may not be easy, but, but if that happened, then even taking one fourth of the impact, it can be above 3%. But I didn't factor into that, uh, you remember, household debt, inequality, inequality, a lot of studies shown that including mine, uh, it can damage uh, economic growth through many different channels. And the, in Korea case, then I estimated about 1.7 percent point actually reduction annually because of that. But in, in the bottom line, in a sense, if you look at this, low productivity growth, high inequality, and then the household debt, this is a really serious uh, symptom of a macroeconomic imbalances. And there's some of the studies in recent years showing that this is a strong predictor of a financial crisis. Although I said, thanks to the very strong, stringent regulation in the debt and et cetera, the likelihood is still low. But that's showing that uh, uh, serious problem. And also it can show up as the uh, populist movement or uh, policies. We have some taste on the Moon Jae-in. It's not going to go away, because why? Korea. Politics, I didn't have time to talk about it. I'm not, although I'm not an expert, but I thought about it and wrote some uh, uh, chapters. But this political you know, incapability to manage the social risk, on top of this headache, rising inequality and then uh, slowing down uh, growth, they oftentimes uh, resort to the uh, very easy, easy fix, spend the money. Well, they had a lot of other agenda under the name of income-led growth, Moon Jae-in government. But um, essentially, it is a bottom line is a fiscal uh, activism. They spend a lot of money to buy other voters, yes? And um, so that's where we are. And yet, I hope that I convince you one way or another, Korea still has a pretty significant offside of potential because uh, we have this type of a problem, wrong recognized, but then uh, probably if we, um, the politics, really seriously do something about it, then there is actually hope. So uh, that's I, what I promised earlier. There is actually positive news out of that because uh, still Korea has a long way to go. And uh, if they get it right, then they can do, well, of course, one of my friends at the Korea, Bank of Korea uh, told me uh, when I published that, you know, the uh, foreign affairs, then he was telling me, you know, uh, what you're wishing for, what you're actually hoping for, it's not going to happen because, you know, to uh, report their own business, Bank of Korea, then they're not talking about the business they're actually meet for. Rather, they're just accusing each other or the something else. And then meeting just uh, ended without any... Uh, mentioning this, the, the real <laughs> topics they're supposed to discuss. So I get here, and also the KF, another government institute, um, senior manager, he told me that, you know, he's convinced my uh, worst case scenario, right? Long-term stagnation. He told me that, yeah, I'm convinced. It'll be a probability one. <laughs> it's going to happen. So uh, that's kind of a uh, gloomy situation. But... Um, but at least uh, we have uh, uh, you know, something uh, to talk about. And uh, hopefully that uh, uh, somebody uh, will take up. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.